All right, everyone. I am here with Stevie Chancellor. Stevie is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Minnesota. Stevie, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Thank you so much, Sam. I'm really excited to talk to you about some of my work, human-centered machine learning. What do you want to know? Awesome. I'm really looking forward to our <laughs> conversation as well. Uh, we like to start off with giving you an opportunity to share a bit about your journey with our audience. How did you come to work in human-centered machine learning? Oh, that's a really interesting question. So one of the secrets to my success is that I did not start in computer science. I actually left computer science for, I would say, stereotypical reasons why women leave CS. Uh, I actually started as a CS major at my undergraduate institution at the University of Virginia and moved to machine or moved to media studies as a major because I wanted to focus on technology. But I got really bored, not bored, but I got... Uh, I missed coding a lot. I had done a lot of coding in high school and really wanted to bring that back into my work and saw this really uh, important intersection between the technology that we build and having strong knowledge of that building process and how we apply it and have it deploy in real communities and systems. And so in my PhD in human-centered computing, I was able to combine both of those interests and get technical experience that built on my prior coding uh, background and pull in that human-centered side. So now I'm a computer science professor. Uh, the trick is that I just don't have a CS degree. I just taught myself a lot of stuff. Nice, nice. And your, your PhD in human-centered computing, was that machine learning focused or uh, another area of human centricity in computing? Yeah, so I would say that my work is focused on, or that work was focused on machine learning primarily. Um, but the human centered computing degree has this nice, I'll call it a little twist where you're trying to learn social and community theories to better understand how um, communities react to technology, as well as how you can think about the deployment of this from more ethical or community centered perspectives. So I have both of those backgrounds speaking to the work that I do. Nice, nice. And uh, was that, um, if I asked you to define human-centered machine learning, would you define it in the same way? Or um, is there another way that you would, or, or some additional nuance that you would have us think about it? Yeah, I think that there's a little nuance, especially because most, I think, computer scientists and developers think about human centeredness like a user centered perspective, right? Like we user have UI, or, yeah, yeah, user experience in UX, and having somebody who works on design and development of your front facing or your front end applications. Uh, but human centeredness is a little different. I think human centeredness asks us to consider beyond just the person who's interacting with our technologies and think about who people or humans might be that interact with technologies. And I like to use the example of facial recognition as a really good one when you're walking through the airport. So when you walk up to like custom screening and it scans your face to allow you to go through customs at in US airport checkpoints, um, you think that the user is the person who's being scanned. But there are also people who are ambiently walking by in these systems that might get picked up by the technology. The user may be the customs border agent or the government that's using it, as well as people who decline to be scanned because they have reasonable privacy and security concerns. And so if we took a human-centered perspective on that, all of those people's perspectives and concerns and values and worries may impact how we develop that technology. And so for me, I think about sort of all those stakeholders and how their values and ethics and perspectives influence what we want to do with machine learning in particular. Mm, that, that's really interesting. I don't think about, I don't recall having that thought in the airport, walking by one of those scanners, but it made me think about Whenever I hear that high pitched whine of a drone, I get really antsy right? and wondering who's looking at me and what's well, I mean, going this on with that. CCTV <laughs> is a really good example. I mean, there's yeah. other places where surveillance and technology intersect, where it's not just a single person who's using a phone, right? It may be a couple, or it may be nobody who declines to use something, right? There's mm -hmm. this big constellation of people when we want to develop and deploy a technology that have important perspectives on how it's used and the kind of of implications it can have in the world. And if we don't consider those, I think we run the risk of deploying things that may not be mindful of what people want and need in situations, but also have some unsavory and unintended consequences that come along with it. Mm -hmm. And 
your work also focuses on individuals with mental illness and high risk. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So the the way I kind of look at this human centered machine learning stuff is through high risk mental illness behaviors. Now, stereotypically, we think about these as what we would call like dangerous behaviors, self injury, suicide crisis. Um, pro-eating disorder behaviors, but I call them high risk in particular because just because you talk about injuring yourself or having suicidal thoughts doesn't mean you're actually going to hurt yourself, which is an important distinction in thinking about how you might make a prediction on somebody who posts in a forum that they're thinking and they're sad and that they're really thinking of harming themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Just because somebody says that doesn't mean that they're going to do it. And we need to think about that whole cycle of the psychology and the place and the social support that that person has, as well as what a platform could provide for them in a larger sense of developing machine learning technologies that can help us identify when people are struggling and what to do when we have an idea that someone may need some help. Mm -hmm. uh, drilling on that a little bit deeper, isn't yeah. the kind of conservative, proactive thing to do is to take all those statements at face value and um, treat them accordingly, try to get the person help if, uh, you know, if it's a person who's invited, who we've, we're connected to in that way. Yeah. So I think, so a good example of this, there are online communities where people can go and talk about, um, themselves when they perceive that there may be in crisis. Now mm -hmm. we can think of different ways to intervene, uh, for somebody who's in crisis based on how severe they may be. And so, yeah, we probably should have a reaction to somebody and make some kind of intervention. But I don't love the term intervention because that kind of implies we're sending somebody to their door to like do a wellness check physically on them. Sometimes people just need someone to talk to or they need access to better support resources given their situation. And if we can nuance out what people need, which is what clinical psychologists, psychiatrists and ER doctors already do through our AI technologies, then maybe we can make a better recommendation than just showing up and assuming that there's a one size fits all uh, solution to somebody when they're in crisis. Mm -hmm. So how do we go about doing that in a way that incorporates machine learning? Yeah. So I have some prior work on sort of understanding severity levels. So if somebody is talking about their eating disorders, right, you can imagine that people's mental illness state changes over time. Some days, weeks, or months, it may be more severe than others, and they may be acting on or describing symptoms or behaviors that may uh, warrant different kinds of or urgency in the intervention that you might propose. So I have some work on using people's uh, social media posts and the tags that they use on Instagram to understand how that changes over time. And we collaborated with two clinical psychologists who have experience with inpatient uh, treatment of eating disorders. And we worked with them about what signs and symptoms worry them the most to be able to make a gradation across a low, medium, and a high scale. We've also done similar work, and we're uh, this is under submission now, so I can't talk too, too much about it, um, but doing the same thing and teasing out different uh, factors that might influence somebody to be in suicide crisis. Uh, talk about how you collect a data set for this kind of problem. Yeah, so for me, because of the way that I think about these problems, it's really important to get data that is publicly available, that would be available if I were just scrolling Instagram and clicked on your profile. So mm -hmm. the data sets that I've gathered are millions of posts from social media sites with public facing information. So places like Instagram, Tumblr, uh, Reddit data, um, those are the big ones that I've worked on so far. Now, I think that there's an important point to draw here about what does it mean to be public in this scenario? Because a lot of people who even make their Twitter and Instagram profiles public probably don't know that researchers can download that data through an API and then use that data to throw it into a machine learning algorithm, whether that be right. for identifying faces in photos or identifying their uh, mental illness sort of severity or their status, mm -hmm. right? And so things get really challenging when people don't have that expectation uh, built up already. So one of that's one of the reasons I like to use the public data. And then we try really hard to anonymize out and take out identifying information so we can key in on signs and symptoms of mental illness without having to use uh, 
personal information on that. So I don't do work. I don't care about people's usernames. I don't care about where they live. We don't include that information because it could spotlight someone and identify them in an algorithm. And that would be really dangerous for people who are struggling with mental illness. Mm -hmm. And did the data sets that you use in this research also have the ultimate outcome, their long-term well-being indicated? Like, are, are you trying to um, identify patterns between their behavior online and whether they actually attempted to harm themselves or, or something like that? Oh, that's a really good question. So one of the challenges of using social media data is we often don't have um, in-person records of the kinds of behavior that they have. Mm -hmm. We do know from a really long history of social media research that people tend to be honest on social media, even if they do curate their profiles on Facebook, say, to have more positive or more negative information, right? The disclosures that people make are honest. And so if somebody does say, I really thought I was really struggling last week, you know, these kind of things, I did these things. We trust that what they're telling us is actually true because most of the research shows that it is. Now, there is some research, and I'm trying to get into this area more, that works directly with patients who would be able to communicate when they've actually had certain symptoms or certain um, conditions that pop up. The challenge was that if you only focus on patients, you only get people who are under the care of a doctor doctor and not people who may not be comfortable with or have gone to a doctor yet, which is a huge swath of the population when you're talking about mental illness, because so, so few people are treated for all kinds of illness, whether that be depression and anxiety all the way to suicide. And so we try and strike a balance of taking people's disclosures of what they do at face value and trust that what they're telling us is real in their social media post, while also realizing we need that kind of um, the, the doctor verification and the real verification of these kinds of systems when we build them and try to deploy them in certain kinds of contexts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In terms of the machine learning methods that you used in approaching this problem, uh, what was what were the some of the tools that you applied? Yeah, so most of the work that I've done has focused on natural language processing and computational linguistics, in part because a lot of social media data is text-based, even on Instagram. Uh, one of the things we found in some of my prior work on people's behaviors on Instagram is that people use hashtags really suggestively to indicate intentions, their emotions and feelings, almost even more so than the images that they post along with it. Hmm. And those um, hashtags are a really important communication tool for people in mental illness communities about their current state and well-being. I have done some work on um, computer vision and using that for uh, a Tumblr data set when I interned at Tumblr in 2017. Uh, we were working alongside moderators to help them better process through their cues and understand and find content that may be um, at at risk of uh, being removed from their platform because it violated community guidelines. And so I tend to focus, like I said, on uh, computational linguistics, uh, but have used computer vision in the past. And I have some newer work that's getting into, I guess, some more state-of-the-art techniques um, on convolutional uh, graph neural networks and uh, using that to help identify and discover new kinds of um, behaviors for people who struggle with opioid use disorder as well. Okay. And is that, is that work published yet or not yet? It's, it's okay. current. So I can talk a little <laughs> bit about it. I have a, I have an early stage paper that used, uh, uh, word embeddings and computational linguistics to be able to find people who disclose, um, alternative therapies. So people in communities about, um, who are, are people in communities who are struggling with opioid use disorder, what we call opioid addiction. Mm -hmm. Often we'll go to online communities to find treatment protocols and patterns that may supplement or go or help them get through uh, the worst parts of opioid uh, abuse withdrawal. withdrawal. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, I, I have a paper out um, from 2019 that looks at, uh, that uses word embeddings to tease out and find those alternative therapies or those new or novel techniques that people are talking about in the forum. And one of the things we want to do is automate that process so that we can extract that information as it pops up, both for 
toxopharmacovigilance, which is a huge mouthful of a word that basically is what are people using and what are the toxic and pharmacological properties of the substances that they're suggesting in these communities, as well as generatively um, identifying those new substances from the community without us having to manually annotate everything. And so we're using a graph convolutional neural network uh, to accomplish that since it's uh, a semantic labeling task. Mm -hmm. And that's you what need we've to seen. create the embeddings. Yeah, it's basically like a, an embedding layer for a, an entity recognition system and then a convolutional neural network across sentences to be able to identify like high up in text if somebody is like, hey, I was using vitamin B and I used 50 milligrams of this every day for you know six weeks to be able to connect those concepts together and actually be able to show that information along with the post itself and some more context to clinical collaborators who could say like, oh, I know why they're doing this. I make this suggestion to them when they go into uh, withdrawal because, or they're trying to recover because it helps with restless leg syndrome or, ooh, that's new. I don't know about that. Let's do some research about that from the clinical literature. Mm. And in what dimension does the, the graph come into play? Um, so after you have the named entities across the whole text data set, um, mm -hmm. you need to be able to connect those entities to each other in ways. And the graph is really important to connect between sentences and between paragraphs. So some of these posts are really, really long with really extensive treatment protocols. And to be able to connect those dosages and um, drugs and the duration that they use them for together, you need a graphical representation of mm -hmm. those um, entities. Mm -hmm. and, and to make sure I'm, I'm clear on this, the CNN isn't being used in a your traditional image visual nope. way. It's just on the sentence data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This stuff is pretty new. We're still working on it and trying to get it out soon. Um, it's done <laughs> on the, I don't know, should I be talking? I feel like I actually... I'm poking up against the edge of what you don't want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's I, it's not that I don't want to talk about it. I actually, and you know, good ideas are are really easy to find. It's just getting them done and having people to help write it up, which can be the tricky part. Uh -huh. um, no, the the technique that we're adopting is from the um, it's from a you you think of the the whole graphical network of part of speech tagging in a document um, as the graph of interconnected entities. And you can apply that with uh, specialized entities that we've already developed from like a kind of a drug focused uh, annotation task. And so you can combine those entities with part of speech tagging and interrelations between sentences already, and then use the, the graph convolution networks to be able to make predictions on what pairs actually go together. Mm. Interesting, interesting. And so I'm, I'm curious in what ways your background in uh, in HCI and human factors, human-centered machine learning, how does that impact the way you would approach this problem? The techniques are, you know, the techniques that any NLP researcher may, might try to use. Yeah. What does the, the human-centered element add to your approach? Yeah, so I like to think of the human-centered approach as influencing the way I try to solve problems from the start. Um, it helps inform what problem tasks I think are good things that need to be solved, in part because I spend a lot of time like hanging out and it, understanding the communities that I work with. So I only have one area of research that I focus on, which is these high risk or dangerous mental illness behaviors. I have one area and that means that I can go deep in understanding those communities needs. We've done previous interviews with people in those communities about the things that they find comfortable or uncomfortable. Um, we work with doctors in that space. So I have a really deep domain understanding of that work. That being said, my expertise as a computer scientist doesn't replace working with doctors and users and moderators, right? I still need them to help me figure out what are the important tasks that you need solved that I wouldn't know if I were just looking at a, a huge pile of Reddit data and wanted to start solving things. And so in some ways, like the human-centered approach helps me find the right tasks without going in and trying to find them myself because I ask people what they want and what they need. And that kind of approach of using doctors to help understand the tasks, maybe talking to moderators about where their gaps are or their bottlenecks are in their moderation pipelines, 
we bring that kind of a, an approach through the whole design and development process of, okay, if we're making a moderation system for you that helps you sort uh, posts as they come in through the queue, would you prefer to have less false positives or less false negatives? And then helping them make that decision so we can tune an algorithm that works for their needs. Same thing for working with users. Maybe users don't want certain kinds of information to be seen by moderators. They feel uncomfortable with that kind of stuff being visible with their case, or they get frustrated with stuff. We can bring that kind of um, understanding and approach throughout the whole process. I think I, yeah, I talked about that. I also talked about making decisions about the ways that models are tuned. You can also imagine bringing that in for training data or other kinds of task specific methods you might select from. Mm -hmm. So would you say that the, the human centered computing background and degree um, left you with a set of tools that you use in applying, uh, that, that you use and apply to these kind of problems, or did it create a mindset for you, a type of humility even that, uh, you bring to these problems or, or, yes, or both? And both. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, human computer interaction has a really awesome set of tools that we use in trying to help develop interfaces, right? We do user interviews and focus groups. We do cognitive walkthroughs where people walk through technologies and tell you where they get stuck or how they get frustrated. It's starting to happen now, especially in the fairness, accountability and transparency space, as well as in the machine learning space, that those user perspectives are not just for when you're done with the system and you need to have a front end interface to interact with somebody, that those perspectives are really valuable in helping you make decisions about the ways you uh, deploy systems from the start. How you conceptualize that machine learning task and translating kind of like what I think of as like a pro-social goal, say, of trying to find people when they're in suicide crisis. That's a really pro-social goal because we want to help people at the end of the day. Translating that into an ML task is a really difficult conceptualization process. And data scientists and developers are trying to manage that mapping of a really social task to kind of quantifiable metrics of what make people tick. And the reality is if you go and ask people, they're probably going to tell you before you even start what they want. And the kinds of things that you should look for in the system. And so in some ways, it's a human centeredness is a, a set of methods that in some ways make my life a little easier because I kind of know what people want when I talk to them about problems and start to build things. But it's also a mindset and perspective of the systems I build aren't ultimately to advance my own career, right? I'm an academic. I need to publish papers. I want to invent cool things because I love coding and I love building. But I also have this very important pro-social focus with the work. And so for me, it's about making sure I meet those communities' needs and don't trample all over them when I develop something that may actually be useful, kind, and ethical towards that, that community's values. Mm. Uh, you're, you've mentioned this, a lot of your work involves the use of AI in the context of social media, and you've done some papers about that. Can you uh, can you elaborate on, um, you know, what you think are kind of the the big issues from a human center perspective uh, in using social media as a data source? You've yes. touched on that a bit, but uh, any additional thoughts there? Yeah, no, I think one really important piece is knowing, <laughs> I joke about this from the Princess Bride perspective. It's like, you're using that word and you're saying these things, but you don't actually, <laughs> think, I don't think it means what you think it means, right? Uh, that's actually a really big issue when it comes to identifying mental illness. So mental illness is one of the most challenging types of disorders and disease that we deal with as medical, as medical professionals would deal with, in part because the definitions and ways we define those things change. Very often, there were major updates to the DSM, which is or the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for Mental mm -hmm. Disorders, um, when they move from version four to version five. That actually changes the classification system of people's mental disorders, where things will move from like an anxiety disorder to their own new category of disorders. That classification system is one of many ways that you can use to understand what it means to have anxiety or what it means to have depression. And so making sure that we operationalize our concepts from 
the clinical things that we care about to the machine learning systems is really, really difficult because you can't just say, oh, I'm going to run, you know, that screener that you do at the doctor's office. And I'm going to do that as the researcher on every single post. Like you're not the person who is being asked those questions. And so you can't just do that. Operationalizing that is really, really challenging. And then I think that for, especially for machine learning perspectives, Understanding the social implications of trade-offs in precision and recall is really, really important um, and is really hard. So in the case of a suicide crisis, um, there are some companies and social media companies that have actually deployed um, algorithms behind the scenes that help moderators identify when somebody may be experiencing crisis. Facebook publicly announced that they had done a collaboration with a major suicide prevention organization, and they have this algorithm running behind the scenes that looks at your Facebook feed. Now, or, and they look at your Facebook feed to make sure that it predict or to try and predict if you're about to injure yourself. Now, a false positive in this situation means that the algorithm falsely identifies that you might be in crisis depending on the intervention may not be that big of a deal because a human looks at it and says, no, it's not that big of a deal. We're not going to do anything. They get locked out of your Facebook account for three hours while you have to go through like a process to get access back to it. A false positive, however, if that means an in-person like intervention shows up to your house is incredibly burdensome, but also really creepy if Facebook mm -hmm. is able to like deploy those kind of resources. Right. Likewise, a false negative where it misses somebody in crisis kind of challenges our notion of who's responsible for suicide interventions, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we miss, if Facebook misses someone and someone actually does end up take, making an attempt on their own life, I don't know if that's Facebook's fault because we wouldn't normally ascribe that kind of fault to a person or responsibility, but things start getting kind of dicey when Facebook is saying it's running these systems behind the scenes. And mm -hmm. I don't know that we have good answers to either of those scenarios about what is an appropriate or inappropriate intervention. Do you think that prevents the platforms from doing all that they could to try to help out in these scenarios? Uh, the, the fear that, if they do anything at all, they set an expectation that they could and therefore, um, you know, set themselves up for this unknown legal risk. Yeah, I imagine it is. And especially in the case, because we don't even like right now have good definitions of responsibility for intervening with high risk or crisis situations. Like if, for instance, I miss the fact that my best friend is in crisis, nobody's going to blame me legally but they may blame me socially for not being more attentive. And now when companies like large scale organizations have longitudinal histories of your behavior, years and years of posts, you have a sudden shift, like maybe those social responsibilities change. And I don't know that they would be, I don't know that they're legally responsible, but I imagine that there is a risk in that calculation of how right are we getting this and how good are we at making these predictions? How much human resource do we have to actually look at our predictions to make sure we're doing a good job? I know that um, moderation and community safety teams are already overwhelmed with tons of other issues that come up. And now we're asking them also to look at a bunch of predictions on whether or not somebody's in crisis. That's really burdensome for them and adds to their labor and emotional work that they do. And then Facebook legal, I, or I don't want to put words in Facebook legal's mouth, but I wonder if they think about these kinds of responsibility questions and how that changes how we think about social networks and platforms intervening in situations like suicide or other kind of socially thorny issues that happen in platforms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you mentioned the, the DSM, I had this, you know, this picture came to mind of this, you know, thick manual. And then I thought about the, I don't know if I had to, you know, enumerate them dozen or so words that I might have at my disposal <laughs> to describe mental illness. And it made me, think about kind of this task that you have of, uh, of and the relationship between kind of language, colloquial language, yeah. diagnostic and professional language. Um, and what I imagine is a, a pretty significant gulf between those two. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you think about that or address that issue? What have you learned about um, the both the language in this, you know, the issues around language in this domain, but also kind of bridging colloquial and professional language generally. 
Yeah. So I think that one of the challenges with that bridging between like colloquial language of, you know, I'm feeling down today versus what I think the DSM would call like dysrhythmia in mood. Um, <laughs> that's really a like I, I had to think about what the technical term or the like clinical term for that is. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's really difficult to make sure that you're operationalizing out the symptoms specifically in the first place, because some people who are depressed don't experience dysrhythmia with their mood. They just are blue for three or four months or they lose interest in things that used to bring them immense amounts of pleasure, like is spending time with family and friends. Right. And so it's really challenging to make sure that you operationalize out each of those symptoms that may be listed in a guide like the DSM. And I think kind of gets, it's almost like seeing the trees and missing the forest, that people's experiences with mental illness may not perfectly map to the ways that DSM talks about these illnesses, right? I think there's been some, go ahead. You go through that when you say operationalize out in this context. Yeah, yeah, what exactly yeah. do you mean? Yeah, yeah. Operationalization is like something I'm very preoccupied with in part because I'm happy I Me can too, pronounce. Me too, but I suspect that the way I think about it is totally <laughs> different from that. Well, I'm, A, I'm happy because I can actually pronounce that word without stumbling <laughs> over it anymore. Uh, but when I think of operationalizing an idea, let's say that I want to go and look at suicide crisis on social media data. Now, mm -hmm. I, as a computer scientist, have an idea of what that may look like. I need to go ask my doctor and clinical friends, as well as the people who are in these communities, like, what is crisis for you? What do you want an ML system to do? And how do you want that to serve you? And operationalizing that concept of the idea that I have in my head of building a system that may be useful for people and literally taking that concept and building it into features or building it into training data labels of a binary place of in crisis versus not. That's what I'm talking about when I say operationalizing. And so in the case of DSM ideas, let's say you have a symptom that's that dysrhythmia of mood. You would need to figure out a quantitative way to measure that in the social media data, whether it's changes in mood over a week, a month, six months, operationalizing and specifying how you make those decisions dramatically impacts the kind of algorithm you have at the end of the day. And those decisions need to be backed by both clinical knowledge because you don't want to just be shooting in the dark to hope you get it right. But they also need to be backed by things that are um, aware of and sensitive to the people who you're going to deploy the prediction on. Mm -hmm. uh, that speaks to so much in kind of the machine learning realm. Um, uh, I think it, you know, the, it, it speaks to that these systems aren't a black box that you like plug in a Twitter feed and you get these indications of no. uh, dysrhythmia, <laughs> of mood. Uh, it also speaks to this kind of ongoing discussion about bias in machine learning. Yeah. Like that is a, a clear example of how a bias can be introduced into the algorithm itself that doesn't come from the data. It comes from the perspective of the practitioner. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, not making any judgments on that, whether that bias is positive or negative, or whatever, but it's the perspective of the practitioner that goes into this operationalization process that yeah, absolutely. Uh, ultimately produces the system. Yeah. So one of the things I think that's important in thinking about that operational price or operationalization process. Man, I said I could say it and I can't. Um, Somebody taught me oh, like 016N or something like that. Uh, I forget the number okay. of, of letters. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the idea like that you can just stick a Twitter feed in and get um, information back is like not the way that it works. Uh, but I also think that it's important to realize that that your idea of bias here is really valuable because those decisions that you make of what needs to be examined and who is being examined in social media, when you build those training data sets, I'll use the binary example of like, is in crisis versus not, it's at some points a subjective process. It's not nearly as objective as I think giving a set of images to a crowd working resource and saying, hey, can you find the places that have beaches or where are the motorcycles in this image, right? That's a more objective process than is this person in crisis? That's really, really hard to label and takes a lot of time. And so honestly, most of the time in my works is spent on 
those kinds of questions like, okay, what do we actually mean when we say crisis? How do we label this within data? What kind of features are we going to put in this? And how are we going to model this problem in a way that is respectful of the clinical knowledge that we have, as well as what users are telling us? Mm -hmm. And so is the implication that your labeling is primarily performed by professionals or have you figured out ways to distill uh, that professional insight to less uh, skilled labelers? So most of uh, all of my work has been labeled by what I would call computer science domain experts like myself, okay. working with a set of doctors or working and having doc or having doctors directly label the data sets. And one of the things I really want to start expanding into is how do you ask people to label their own data sets and experiences for you? If you want Instagram or Facebook to have a more personalized experience to your own needs, eventually you're going to have to have people tell you what they want and help you label that data themselves. And so we're working on techniques of not only bringing in those users and having people label their own data, but also how could you build systems where less experienced labelers typically or stereotypically that's crowd workers for machine learning, how you might develop surveys and, um, other short form uh, like information tasks where they can label data for you. I don't know, there is some early stage research on that that's showing promise in the space, but I think we're gonna need to work really hard on teaching normal people how to identify signs and symptoms of crisis because most people aren't trained on it. And to be quite honest, some of this content's pretty disturbing and I have, qualms about showing this to people who are working for lower wages than I do on crowd working platforms and asking them to see some kind of disturbing stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You describe your, your role, your uh, approach as kind of this middle ground between applied machine learning and um, like someone focused on AI ethics. Can you you know, maybe let's zoom out a little bit and have you contextualize uh, from from that perspective, the that uh, spectrum that you laid out? Yeah. So when I think about doing my work, um, I think about making contributions in two spaces. I think the technical side is really interesting, though I don't focus on like what I think most people would think of as core machine learning. I'm more interested in applying these systems to see what we can do in this domain. Um, but the other thing that I've been focused on, especially or like more recently, has been what are the social implications of these systems? I mentioned earlier the false positive versus false negative trade-offs that you get with developing algorithms. But there's also really interesting questions about duties of care and responsibility to intervene um, and how we can help machine learning practitioners think through those before they deploy a system. What are the best methods to be able to suss out some of those concerns that a community might have if they're now being subject to prediction? And so that prediction is sometimes for mental illness detection. It's sometimes for preventative means. Sometimes it's for moderation because some of the content is disturbing and is against community platforms uh, or the community guidelines on platforms. And so when I think about that AI ethics question, I think a lot about how can we think about these questions earlier to anticipate what these issues may be and find the right people and the right methods to mitigate those concerns. And if we can't mitigate them because we can't mitigate them all, how do we recognize the risks that these systems have when we deploy them? Hmm. Is there a reference that comes to mind that you think would be a good uh, introduction to human-centered human computing and uh, the, the methods that you use? Are you interested more in the human-centered computing side or in At the ML stuff that I do? Uh, the human, the, so the first question, we'll, uh, we'll get to that. <laughs> but the first question is, um, you know, for folks that are, you know, intrigued by this conversation and this approach and want to go beyond empathy and take some of the tools off of the tool shelf that you bring to your work, you know, what's a good introduction to that tool set? So I think that a really good intro to a community that cares both about the methods perspective and that technical rigor, as well as the AI ethics is gonna be the fairness, accountability and transparency community. 
-hmm. in the machine learning space. That would be the FACT or F-A-C-C-T conference. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of really great work focused on primarily on fairness in those communities, but that community over time has turned to methods about discrimination and bias and transparency, explanations, but there's some really fantastic work that happens in that space. Um, about equity and justice and centering of people's perspectives. So that community broadly has tons of really cool work. The conference just happened. Um, and there was a bunch of awesome papers that I saw uh, going across my Twitter feed. Um, in particular, I really love, because I do so much computational linguistics and natural language processing has been so close to linguistics, which is a social science already. I think that people like Emily Bender in particular have a really smart and slick um, approach to ethics that doesn't let go of that technical worker, right? When I talk to people in ML, they're always worried that like the technical side is going to fall apart. And I actually think that by talking to people, you actually make your technical stuff like, I don't want to call it quote unquote more causal, but you make it more powerful when you can say, we talked to 25 users and this is what they told us that they wanted and what we they were worried about. So we avoided these things to respect their wishes, right? Because they told us they didn't want us to predict on this specific feature. You know, that gives that work, I think, more power and emphasis and can help that work have more robustness. So Emily is great. Um, Dirk Hovey has some really, really good stuff as well. Cool. And we'll link to our interviews with Emily in the show notes. Oh, you've interviewed uh, but, Emily. She's great. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so the second part of that question, uh, where's the best place to learn more about your work? Yeah. So I actually, I think there's a couple cool places that you can come in on this AI ethics question. Um, I have a couple papers that I've written that kind of talk about the AI ethics issues that emerge in building these kinds of systems. Uh, one was actually published at the Fairness, Accountability and Transparency Conference. Um, and it sets up this like really uh, in-depth taxonomy about the whole ML development process when you wanna make predictions on mental illness using social media data. Um, but there's also been some interesting work that I've done on AI ethics and questions about that operationalization. Oh, I got the word right this time. Uh, operationalizing concepts correctly. Um, and you can find these on my website, uh, steviechancellor.com, as well as through my Twitter, which is, I think, SN Chancellor. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Stevie, it was wonderful having the opportunity to chat with you and learn a bit about what you're up to. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I had a lot of fun chatting. Same here. Same here. Thank you. Thank you.